Okay, so dear audience, I'm told that we are live now. It has been three times that we tried to go online. I hope now it will be uh, working. So again, um, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Verfassungsblock Symposium on vicarious hegemony and the anti-hegemonic thrust of European law. And we are going to have a conversation. My name is Samin from Mokdani and I'm from the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And my task is to moderate a wonderful panel on that topic consisting of Marta Cartabia from Bocconi University, Daniel Halberstam from Michigan Law School, Anna Sletzinska Simon from the University of Wrocław, and Antoine Boucher from University Sorbonne. But I'm also moderating you. So please, the audience, please feel invited to join our discussion. Since we have little time, please use the chat function of Verfassungsblock. You find it below your uh, screen. Write in your comments, write in your questions, and Eric Tuchtfeld will then bring them into our discussions. We have 60 minutes. They are divided into two blocks. The first block is more uh, analytical, and it will focus on Antoine Boucher's thesis on vicarious hegemony. And then the second part we have uh, will focus on Daniel Haberstam's anti-hegemony anti uh, thesis, and we will proceed in the same way. We only have 30 minutes, so I have to be rigorous with uh, the time. Be with me. So having said that, please, Antoine, take the floor. Okay, well, thank you very much, Armin, for uh, setting up this uh, transnational discussion on uh, German legal hegemony. Um, I'm going to be very quick because I am, I just, I'm, I'm aware that uh, the discussion is the most interesting part here. Um, of course, uh, hegemony is a difficult world. I want to start with this. It's uh, even to some extent a dangerous word in the context of the European uh, Union. Um, we know it runs counter to the idea of equality of all states and of all uh, citizens in, in, uh, in the European project. Um, we also know it runs counter to the normative ideal of uh, the field of European law uh, in which all legal cultures to, um, to, in a way, are expected to contribute to the Europeanness of European law. But it's true also that in the context of the post-Brexit and the post-financial crisis, uh, the issue of German hegemony comes, um, uh, you know, in a way, quite, um, quite more, more stronger. Um, of course, for the reason that there is indeed an economic dominance of uh, Germany, um, and uh, a question is raised as to the consequences in a variety of policy fields and a variety of, of fields like, of course, uh, law. But I also want to add that there is no yes or no answer to a question of hegemony. It's never full uh, black and white. It's a question of measure. It's a question of research. It's a question of process uh, to extend to which there is um, an ongoing hegemonization. And I think it's important as academics that we keep that uh, uh, as, a, as our, a part of our project. So in my paper, I've tried to turn hegemony into um, a workable notion, um, not just the mere domination of one country, the mere domination of one institution, like the constitutional court, for example, but rather uh, an, an, uh, a notion that allows to understand how one given field here the field of uh, German law, uh, has been able to export its doctrinal, its ideological uh, disagreements and export them to another field, actually the field, uh, the transnational field um, of uh, EU law. So the extent to which we have been collectively trapped uh, into uh, German legal disputes in a way, um, the extent to which uh, we are continuing our usual European discussion and battles uh, vicariously, meaning through uh, our representatives in a way within the German constitutional scene, in particular before the German constitutional court, whether it is through the more pan-European call and to a certain extent German Law Journal, Verfassung's blog are, uh, could be also taken into uh, that uh, poll, or whether we follow that as uh, through, again, vicariously, 
to the more Eurosceptic call uh, by some of the repeat players of uh, uh, the German Constitutional Court. And to a certain extent, I think the, the vice uh, judicial saga, uh, the one before that led to the, the, the big uh, spectacular decision, the PSPP in May, uh, is a good example of that. And uh, it, it was a dispute that happened essentially mostly among German legal and political actors, all called upon to Karlsruhe to testify to as plaintiffs at a variety of roles. But to a certain extent, all along the way, this very German discussion refracted, structured uh, the European de uh, debate over the scope, the limits of uh, European competencies, European law, etc. So why is it, and I will end up with two points here, why is it that um, there is such a gravitational effect of uh, the German legal field over our European discussion? I think I have put two points forward in the paper. One, of course, is that uh, there is a decade long and very rich constitutional discussion in Germany on the European project. And it is now providing in a way the grammar uh, and also the legitimizing umbrella for uh, the current tensions in Europe over um, the, sovereign, the issue of sovereignty, the issue of national identities, the issue of which court has a final world, uh, many you know, of the hot issues of the current, the current moment of European law. And uh, to that extent, I think uh, um, we, are, um, uh, we are taking upon, we're taking this grammar and uh, umbrella uh, to uh, continue our uh, discussion on the European law. So that's the first point. The second point is, of course, related to the powerful position acquired by the federal constitutional courts like no other constitutional court in Europe, and particularly in the context of Europe's, I mean, of the Eurozone crisis. After all, it is the constitutional court of Europe's dominant economic country. And through this, it has acquired a very uh, substantial political leverage. And um, in a context like the one of the EU, where there are very few um, um, uh, very few um, uh, spaces to question monetary and economic policies, uh, where the, the space of political opportunities is very closed. Well, the, the German, the constitutional um, arena is opening somehow um, a chamber of appeal, a chamber of appeal of EU decisions. So we have here a national legal institution providing a transnational political uh, uh, um, uh, chamber of appeal. And this is uh, what I've been somehow pointing at as a sort of mutual trap in which we are now between uh, the German legal discussion and the European uh, political and legal uh, debate over the future of Europe. But I see that, Armin, it's time that I, that I stop. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for exposing uh, the gist of your thesis. And uh, perhaps, Anna, may I ask you to, to comment on, uh, on this thesis? Well, thank you very much for the invitation to the symposium. And even more, thank you for asking me for this um, challenging role um, uh, to, to comment on such an excellent paper. Uh, so, so I, I deeply um, uh, call feel that there is this tension between European integration project as a project that's based on free freedom and liberty and democracy. So, so, so to Antoine's questions, I'll ask, I will add my own question, whether Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, is called right now to play the role of a veto player that challenges legitimacy of decisions of an expert body in that case, um, such as the European Central Bank and indirectly or directly in, in the uh, PSPP decision of the European uh, Court, um, the, the Court of Justice of European Union. 
And I will agree that uh, with the thesis that European Union still lacks effective channels of voicing concerns especially if those concerns come from the people. And now when I speak the people, I mean all the peoples in the member states. Uh, so truly a constitutional court, and now I'm not um, talking only and exclusively about the German constitutional court, but a constitutional court can feel um, an important trigger in this political and, and economic um, dialogue um, and can, legitimately take over the role, but I would add one condition. The condition is that this court is appropriately fulfilling its role as a counter majoritarian power. And that is the crucial point where I wouldn't accept that a constitutional court in any other member state may take the role of a veto player in European politics uh, in large sense, um, if it does not fulfill this role of a counter-majoritarian uh, power, and I mean explicitly um, the, the democratic backsliding and, and politically captured courts in Eastern Europe, mainly Poland and Hungary. Um, so, so this is the only condition. Um, and I see the decision of the of the um, Bundesverfassungsgericht in in the PSPP as a decision that looks forward. It's like to take from Daniel's paper. It's 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 not only barking, it's biting, um, but it's preparing the way, preparing the path for the future to use the same argument in a case where it would it will matter, because as we see at the crisis. The decision of the court did not change anything in the in the approach of the of the European Central Bank, and they, it continued this business as as usual. Uh, but for its future actions, be them pan-European or be them Eurosceptic, this is on the one hand very powerful instrument to say we will review, we will continue with the ultra-virus review, but yet in the hands of courts that do not that are instruments of the political majority of the day, and I mean the Polish Constitutional Court as an example, that's a very, very dangerous um, uh, development. So we should be all um, vigilant. And then again, this refers to Daniel's part. Um, that's more about not the tension between the liberty and democracy, but liberty and equality. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. And I really enjoy and, and wish that we could continue um, in that or another form the discussion that's um, definitely a very insight, insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marta, would you come in, please? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine and Armin, for organizing all this and for Anna for her first comments. Four small points. First, you wrote and also repeated in your oral presentation that hegemony has not to do with the domination. This is something that makes me think a lot. Um, I would like to advance this statement that hegemony has... Uh, more to do with authority than with power. This is a clear distinction in the Roman tradition, potestas in populo and autoritas in senatu, meaning that uh, uh, autoritas, hegemony, is not the power to decide, but to play an enormous cultural influence, the ability to persuade. Power, domination implies the use of force, coercion, imposition. Authority, as Anna Arendt says, is more, an ad more than an advice and less than a command. This means that uh, hegemony, in order to flourish needs some sort of consensus. There, will, there, there is a need of somebody who is ready to take the suggestion in order to advance. And I think that 
here is really something that is happening with the German legal discourse. The Vice saga, second point, is not the first time. Uh, the same has been uh, started since Zolang, Maastricht, Lisbon, and so on and so forth, where the Germans has shaped, have shaped the grammar, the language of the constitutional borders of EU law, and uh, other courts has followed the example, like, for example, the Italian Constitutional Court. We sing on the same score, but uh, in a different tonality. The grammar is the same. It is the grammar based on identity review, ultra virus uh, judicial review. So I think that this is something that has nothing to do with, as is not new, but indeed what is new is that uh, the Germans now bite and do not only bark as uh, Daniel says. Third point, uh, if I properly understand your concern, Antoine, is that uh, this example can go viral all, all over Europe, especially in uh, Central East European countries. And then you give an example. The example is the, the Polish one. But here I think that we have to make a big distinction between, it's not clear when we speak, are we speaking about legal consequences, political consequences, economic consequences? What kind of hegemony are we speaking about? Because I think that when, we, when you quote the Polish government, this is really a different story from uh, the legal hegemony that we are mentioning before. My fourth point uh, is something related to what Anna was saying, is that uh, um, one thing is the political effect that uh, this decision, uh, the PSPP decision can have all over Europe, and a different story is the constitutional um, consequences that, uh, that uh, this decision can have in Europe, because it, this very much depends on the counter-majoritarian role that each constitutional court can play vis-a-vis -vis their national government. So it's really difficult to predict uh, what is going on in different countries. I do not have the feeling, for example, that in Italy this decision will be uh, an example that can have uh, a follow-up in, in our constitutional court. We have another type of relation with the, the, the European Court of Justice. Uh, and in any case, uh, this is my very final last word on this point, if there is a follow-up, meaning that other countries will follow the German example, this is not to promote a German hegemony, but rather to advance a nationalistic discourse, which cannot be exactly the same. A, 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 a other courts following the same example is not a promotion of the German hegemony, but another type of uh, cultural uh, leaning of this time of ours. I will stop here. Thank you very much for, for this. And now I will ask uh, Daniel to come in, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Armin, uh, for organizing this and for inviting me to, uh, to comment on uh, Antoine's piece and then later talk about mine. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Antoine, I, I, I really enjoy this. So uh, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do now, I think in the first half is um, sort of further the analytic understanding um, of what we're talking about, basically. So I, I would, I would um, my, my question is really about uh, whether what you are describing is actually a form of hegemony, and if so, what kind? And so it might be useful to distinguish between sort of two different kinds of hegemony. Uh, one is cultural hegemony. Think of Antonio Gramsci. Uh, think of capitalist ideology, uh, basically permeating society and making everybody sort of think something. Uh, that's cultural hegemony. Uh, now, political hegemony, I'm just going to call it political. Uh, political hegemony would be the IR term, international relations term. Uh, think of uh, American dominance post-World War II, a state dominating 
um, it's, uh, through its political will and sort of influencing other people's decisions. Now, as Marta said, there, it, it, this is not domination, this is not hardcore coercive orders, but yet this is not, and some people say, th th some people say it depends upon the willingness of the followers to follow, but this is not the willingness of equals uh, to follow. This is the willingness of people who lack your resources, uh, who lack your power, um, who lack your stature, um, those are the people who are following you. So it is not an equal uh, uh, playing field. It's not like what Rainer Faust calls of Augenhöhe, speaking with someone else and convincing them. No, 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 no. This is, there is an element of, I want to call it coercion, although uh, this is not military coercion. So both cultural and political hegemony involve an element of coercion. Uh, now in the German discourse, I'll just say sort of looking a little bit forward, Schmidt is kind of the ethno nationalist perversion of Gramsci, uh, right? In this article that, 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 that um, Armin talks about. So Schmidt is kind of this first version of cultural hegemony. And Triebel is kind of the nationalist, anti-liberal, anti-democratic perversion of modern liberal IR theory, uh, which means state leadership. So that's Triebel. So you have Schmidt and Triebel who are these counterparts to cultural hegemony and political hegemony. And they are the counterparts in the German discourse. And so, the, and so now you come in and you say in wonderful ways, you say this, we have vicarious hegemony. And so there my question is, what is vicarious hegemony? Is it um, cultural hegemony? Is it political hegemony? Is it a combination of the two? Is it a new form of hegemony? And then finally, is it hegemony at all? Uh, it might not be hegemony at all. Is it perhaps a theater uh, in which, a cathartic theater uh, in which everyone's understanding and uh, uh, everyone's uh, problems with the European Union are actually played out in the German theater wonderfully. That still does not suggest that the German theater is directing other people's wills, uh, right? That just means there's sort of vicarious, uh, 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 vicarious morality play that is happening in Germany and that inspires others to do things. So if Germany would go away from today to tomorrow, in my view, the EU would collapse. But in terms of uh, what, what we're talking about, in terms of your vicarious hegemony, if the German courtroom would close, everybody else has sort of, it's like the Germans might, might have invented the wheel. Now they didn't invent the wheel, but if they invented it, the others are gonna use it, not because of any hege hegemonic force, but just because it's a useful discourse. It's just like, it's a simply uh, useful discourse. So is it hegemony or is it not hegemony? And I have a second factual question, which is just, uh, uh, I'll do it very quickly, which is, uh, we can talk about it later too, I suppose. Uh, why the German court, I understand uh, what, I understand what you say in here, but could there also be some things about say, the French didn't have a constitutional court uh, for the longest time. So they couldn't play that role. It has nothing to do with any of the elements you suggest. They just didn't have the institution. The UK didn't have the institution. Now, Italy sort of did, but we can talk about that too. So the question is, is there something imminent to the institution of the German constitutional court that let it play this vicarious role, which actually might have less to do with the factors you explained uh, than, than with its sort of institutional uh, position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, that really brings us to uh, Antoine, whether he wants to go with Schmidt or Triebel, that is really quite a challenge. Um, so perhaps we, uh, you might uh, give a first round of, uh, of reactions and then uh, so far we have not had questions. Uh, to the audience again, please feel invited to, uh, to come in, but we first now go to, to Antoine, please. Okay, well, thank you um, to all of you for um, very, very insightful um, comments and um, so, um, yeah, that, that is very enriching. Um, my first point, maybe uh, to Daniel, I, I, I don't think I would have written the same paper if it was about um, econ economic hegemony, um, in which, I mean, German economic hegemony, or how do we think about this situation? And if we were looking at the Eurogroup, and if we were, if we were looking at you know, the, the management of the Eurozone crisis and um, there may be power indeed um, uh, is more uh, directly involved in, in, you know, in Rapport de Force, we, we would see in, um, you know, in, in building the, the, the response or the answer of the European Union to, to the crisis. So I think here in, in, in legal terms, in, in the legal field, I don't see indeed the German constitutional court playing any sort of coercive 
type of world, um, type of role. So that's why I've been trying to think of how could we think the particular situation. And I, I fully am very thankful to, to Marta um, for uh, your, um, your conceptualization. I, I, I hadn't even think of, of it this way between power and authority, but that captures very well um, what I'm, I've been trying to say that indeed it's, it's in terms of, of legitimacy that this hegemony is being played in uh, uh, transforming the source of uh, um, legal authority um, in European law, including, in, in fact, more even more than it used to be the German Constitutional Court and the German legal discussion. Um, so, indeed, I think in terms uh, of... Uh, uh, it's, it, it's really in terms of how the terms of the debate, how the sources of legitimacy have been transformed over the past two decades. And of course, my remarks are very tentative, uh, very, I mean, you know, it's very much of a blog. So, I mean, it's, it, 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 it would require much more work, but I, it's ob obvious that having studied the field of European law in the early 2000s, and looking at the field of European law today, I mean, it's it's such a transformation. And in that story, I think the German constitutional arena, not just the Second Senate, but the general constitutional arena has played a, 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 a very important role in the transformation um, and providing again the grammar for a, a displacement of the discussion uh, to um, issues of sovereignty, issues of national uh, identity, uh, constitutional identity, etc. So, uh, one last point. Um, uh, again, on, on what you were saying, Marta, um, the, the political, the, the the legal. In a way, I think they're very much blurred here. Um, in um, even in this discussion, because because of what is the constitutional um, arena of Karlsruhe, which is continuously bringing political actors in the prétoire, in the audience, uh, you know, as testimonies, as plaintiffs, and, you know, uh, the IFD was built in part in that legal battle, I think, I mean, I'm speaking of the control of, of, uh, of my German colleagues, but I think, so, and, in tr and equally for Poland, of course, it is the government's report that I'm quoting in my text, but it's at this very same time, the future the future argument of the constitutional judges that are nominating now, nominated now at the, at the Polish constitutional court. So it is also part of the new uh, situation of uh, the field of European law that politics and law are far more blurred, I think, uh, than it was uh, used to be uh, 20 years ago. And last point, we don't have a constitutional court um, of that um, long story as, as, as in Germany, in France, um, um, or there is uh, the Conseil d'État that in a way has been playing that role as a sort of, you know, um, Resisting, you know, at some point the 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 the, Euro, the 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 rise of European law as a supranational body of law, uh, but today it's 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 probably not playing that role any, anymore. I'm not saying it's good or, or bad, but uh, of course, in the very um, executive-centered presidential um, structure of French uh, Fifth Republic, uh, there is certainly not that sort of. Uh, uh, check and balances that uh, that is so important in that story. Indeed, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Do you think we sort should still uh, continue with the analytical part, or should we move on to to the more normative part and the anti hegemonic thesis? We move on. Okay, then I would ask uh, Daniel to to come in with his the gist of his argument, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I guess my, uh, my, my, my short paper um, was really to describe uh, or to um, sort of recognize that the European project is a project of anti-hegemony um, and that uh, anti-hegemony uh, as sort of a foundational matter, anti-hegemony as a project is never complete. Um, 
it's 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 a, it's a project that we that we always work on. Um, we don't even see the flaws always that are that are ongoing as we are in it, and we must always work to it. So my main frustration and the reason for intervening uh, in the debate, not with whatever other folks have been saying here, but is is a prior debate in Germany. Uh, where some people are sort of cheering on Germany, saying Germany should actually take on the role of hegemon, and actually saw the Economist as well, sort of cheering on Germany. Um, so in some ways, uh, what I what I was looking at is uh, both the descriptive and the normative claim. So the descriptive claim is whether Germany in fact is a hegemon or not, and then the normative claim whether uh, Germany should play uh, the role um, of hegemon. And so on the descriptive claim, um, uh, in the on, on the Schmidtian question whether Germany sort of controls. Um, uh, European uh, legal method. Um, I sort of say, no, uh, I, I don't really see that. Of course, Germany is quite important, uh, but Germany hasn't sort of controlled a European legal method. Europe doesn't sort of look like Germany. Um, and in a, in, in, in a fundamental way, I actually think that Europe and the European uh, legal sort of discourse structure um, uh, overarching idea is actually really a common law idea. Uh, it's the idea of a selective legislature that occasionally does things uh, with a powerful court that is left to interpreting uh, what the legislature has done uh, with quite some leeway because the legislature is so weak. Um, and it responds actually to political input uh, from, uh, from other actors throughout the entire system. This is not the way the German constitutional court functions within Germany, which is the German constitutional court within Germany has a completely commanding uh, function. Um, and also, uh, uh, so in terms of its position, uh, that's not, I don't think, how the uh, ECJ is seen. I think it's actually much more like the US Supreme Court. In terms of its method, it is not doctrinal as, as the German uh, court tends to be, although we can refine that a little bit. Um, it is much more ecumenical um, as uh, the US Supreme Court actually is just taking, picking and choosing pragmatically from all over uh, whatever happens to suit its purposes uh, for, for the present discussion. So that's sort of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the European Court of Justice, and which I think is not really reflecting in this cultural way uh, what Germany is doing. Um, the second thing is on, on whether Germany has been politically uh, hegemon, hegemon, has it sort of politically directed uh, the will of uh, Europe. Of course, it's terribly powerful, as Antoine uh, recognizes, and lots of people properly recognize. It's, it's quite important, but it is important. Uh, it, it, it is not important to the degree that it directs everyone else. Um, it is usually still acting together with France, um, and uh, it has actually given in on many of its uh, previous red lines, uh, like uh, the fact that it would never uh, engage in, uh, say, cross payments, uh, bailing other people out. Effectively, Mario Draghi has, has done that through the back door and Germany has let it happen. Um, if we see, and, and I'm happy about that. Um, and in the coronavirus package, again, like uh, Germany sort of flip-flopped in terms of uh, what it was willing to pay for. So in terms of cultural hegemony and political hegemony, I don't think Germany actually is there. Now it is, of course, it's a strong player, um, but it is not there. Now, should we cheer Germany on? I would say on the cultural hegemony part, I mean, Nothing more really needs to be said. I mean, the thesis comes from Schmidt that sort of Europe should be Germanic. I don't think anybody really thinks that Europe should be Germanic in its legal culture. I completely agree with, with what Antoine is saying, that, that Germany has sort of developed a certain grammar of, um, of conversation about constitutional terms. Um, that, that is sort of useful. I don't view that as sort of controlling other people's uh, or directing other people's uh, wills. Um, on the on the triple thing, their actually thing on the on the IR question, that is really where lots of people are still willing and itching to jeer Germany on. Just look at the economists, sort of just happy to say, hey, Germany should just stand up and play a stronger role in Europe. And that's no surprise because the economist is sort of an IR place, right? The economist has no interest in uh, liberal progressive constitutionalism, as I think I am and and and, and many and many liberals uh, who are sort of cheering on Europe as a whole are. Uh, we view Europe, at Europe as a liberal constitutional project um, and one in which hegemony should be uh, rooted out at every corner. And so we should not sort of uh, with Triple cheer on Germany and just recognize it. Um, and, you know, Triple was as unsavory on this score as Schmidt was on his score, that uh, Triple was basically a monarchist, a national conservative guy who was an an anti-democrat. And so, of course, he was cheering on Prussia. This was just looking back. Oh, wasn't it great how Prussia led the German Federation? And that's how Germany should now, should now lead Europe. Um, at least that's sort of, you might say, the echoes of Triple in The Economist 
and in those in Germany who are cheering Germany on. And I just want to say, no, uh, the EU is an anti-hegemonical project. Um, the point is anti-hegemony. And to the extent that we see hegemonies, we should work against them. And that goes whether this is single German hegemony or even Franco-German hegemony. That's not good either. Uh, we actually continually have to work uh, against hegemony, uh, even on much more cultural issues that uh, sort of go far beyond uh, this uh, symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for this passionate plea that speaks from my heart. But let's uh, see the comments. And again, Anna, would you would you like to come in, please? Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. This was really a, a very fascinating read. So thank you for for this opportunity to to add your perspective. Um, I want to say that from your nar narration, I see this um, contradiction now between freedom and equality. So European Union as a project that is aimed to facilitate freedom and peace and stability and based on equality of member states in the end has to recognize that there are member states that are, strong, are stronger and unequal um, in many regards. So, so the question I would pose, it's, it's taken from equality law, that is how to disregard the existing differences in order to facilitate equality and freedom in the end. So yet this German um, figure is standing there as this heavy gorilla, which, which you describe in, in the text. Uh, and, and we definitely have to see that there is the imbalance of power in play and the imbalance of power is increasing especially if we look at the field of economic constitutionalism and the um, economic um, processes that go beyond this ordo liberal um, 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 project uh, or, or to go behind and um, so the eco economic power has clear consequences for political and cultural position of Germany. And counteracting this, this argument that you, you try to make, or the normative argument that, you, that you're trying to make, and uh, trying to suggest that, that we should resist the impulse to seek out and cheer on German as a leader, I would say, the other, um, I, I would suggest a different um, um, way, a way out. Um, I believe that Germany, but not Germany as such, but Germany within European Union, shall take the leading role as a promoter of certain political and cultural values. And when I say culture, I mean legal culture, and stand as the guardian of also methodolog methodological uh, purity. And this is what the PSPVP decision is about. It's about methodological uh, purity. But at the same time, with my reference to triple, um, in order to prevent that the enlightened despot, des despot or, or despotism of an individual takes over the despotism uh, of never enlightened masses, I believe that the German project especially concerning the Eastern and, and Central Europe, should be directed towards the masses. Because so far, there has been a lot of German doctrinal influence on the elite, on the legal elite, that's not, that, that did not translate it into the overwhelming support of the liberal democracy by the masses. So now the populist sort of um, turn and and um, and raise raise in in arise in Europe. Um, so so I want to say, uh, counteracting um, this this argument that this is only about uh, this is only about anti hegemonic um, uh, project and um, uh, in in European Union, I would believe that Germany should be leading a very strict. Um, stance on values, especially such as, as um, protection of the rule of law, protection of minority rights, protection of fundamental rights across uh, the European board, uh, and making this economic output that's now basically visible, conditional economic output, I mean, um, growth, economic growth, uh, stability, uh, raising, well, basically quality of life, making it conditional 
on fulfillment of basic values that the European Union is based on. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to react. Thank you very much. Marta, please, could you come in? Yes, thank you. So as far as I understand, two are the uh, central statements in Daniel's uh, paper. First, uh, then there are many other things, but the, 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 the gist, the, the European project was meant and in fact is anti-hegemonic. And second, even more relevant, this anti-hegemonic character uh, is never complete, uh, is always yet to come. Uh, there is a quotation, it says, anti-hegemony itself is a projet sans cesse, anti-hegemony will never be done. Uh, so this says something about the that risks of predominance of one member over the others uh, are always present. And uh, I agree completely 100% with this reading of the European project. Uh, and I think that there is a relation to this reading of this dynamic balance between the parties, uh, the union and the single member states. There is a relation with the idea of uh, constitutional pluralism. Because in my view, pluralism requires a restless tension, a restless dynamism between all the parties, all the members and also the union. But here, uh, I would like to add a provocative remark or question to Daniels. If this is true, and in my view, this is true, we need to Keep, keep ourselves alive with some dynamism in our constitutional relation. The PSPP decision, which is indeed an imperfect move in the European context, something that I feel like I can say this because I also said to my colleagues, pre, former colleagues of the Second Senate, something that is not completely in tune with the, the European discourse. Nevertheless, uh, this decision brings uh, some imperfection that are important and relevant to the European as such because uh, it helps uh, keeping the dynamism alive. There is, uh, there is something that is, uh, uh, notwithstanding the intention, something that is... Uh, uh, in favor of this balance, this di dynamism uh, that we need in order not to have any hegemony in the European context. That uh, is a, a, a side effect of the PSPP decision. Um, let me say in, in a different terms, uh, the position of the, the, the federal German constitutional court and other con national constitutional court, as Lustig and Weiler shows in their third wave uh, of the, 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 the judicial review in Europe, everybody knows about this, uh, this uh, paper, can be interpreted not as something that is against the European project, but is a sort of... Uh, uh, unwilling contribution to maintain this tension, this dynamism, this unstable balance that we need between the parties. A contribution to uh, contradict, to avoid, to, to obstruct in a way a, 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 a centripetal move that can bring a different kind of hegemony in Europe uh, instead of a national hegemony, a different kind of hegemony. Uh, so I would like to, to put on the table this possible reading of the reaction of national constitutional courts that uh, at first sight can be read as a sort of uh, tentative of national hegemonic move of one nation over the others. This is a possible reading. This is the first sight uh, reading that we can have, but they can also in the long term have a different effect, uh, keeping uh, the dynamism that you described so well, Daniel, in your paper alive. 
Uh, Antoine, could you come in, please? Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Daniel, for um, um, this very nice brand, the very nice um, analysis of this normative ideal, um, a normative horizon uh, that is um, indeed at the core of, um, of, of the European project and, and of European law uh, as well. Um, although I think I would say that of course, the hegemonic project is at the core of it, but at the same time, it's, um, as I would insist more in a way on the balancing act that is continuously at the core of law, international law, European law, um, between, let's say, the ideals of law, the ideals of law, which indeed uh, imply equality, um, of all legal traditions, equality of member states. Um, and so the uh, law part of European law, and at the same time, the European part of the European law, in the sense there is indeed um, a variety of um, power asymmetries, and that even lawyers, of course, are aware continuously that there's such uh unbalanced political at balance so there is i my opinion this continuous tension between the recognition that there are specific uh, power imbalance let's say for example in the composition court of justice there are more advocate generals for big member states than for member states so it's a form of acknowledgement that they are bigger countries than um, in terms of um, political power. And at the same time, the ideal of equality of judges um, in the court. In, 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 um, so I think the, um, what is the, the fascinating um, part of that story, I think, is this balance act um, in between the two. Um, what the question is, how what is the language what is the legal language for this anti hegemonic project um how do we how do we concretely add into uh, legal methodology i remember um uh, the paper armin um uh, on the transformation of european law the the, the quest for comparison um so it's com what is the methodology for such methodology for such anti-hegemonic project? Um, is that a more supranational legal project or more comparative law type of approach? What inside comparative law? So, um, so that that in a way was my question um, to to you, and I just wanted to refer to uh, before um, finishing. Of, uh, that is about to be published, and I was discussing with him, uh, Mitch uh, Lasser, um, a book that is about to be published on uh, judicial disappointments is the name, and it's about the how judges the transformation transformation of uh, judges' appointment at the Court of Justice at the European Court of Rights, and his main argument, and maybe I wanted you to react on this, is that you know Article two hundred fifty five, the panel of judges, you know, giving a consultative opinion on judges, on their legal competence, EU law competence, etc. He shows, I think, very well how this transformation uh, has been used in a way as a way for uh, Western uh, countries to somehow discipline or you know, control the, um, you know, the fear that the, the, the entrance of new uh, members, you know, new judges was um, uh, was uh, triggering. Or, or, so um, is there, you know, how would you look at that? The, the, the anti-hegemonic um, uh, ideal here has been in a way in turn, and how does it relate today to some of the um, you know, the political difficulties that we have um, uh, in, in, uh, in relation to the populist, um, populist um, rise. Um, well, that's very, very much of a, of a question, but 
I thought that when we talk about hegemony, we could also bring into the picture the East and West issue um, in the 1990s that maybe um, exposed research is happening is being is making is made it more uh, clear and and this is a uh, you know a matter of more research of course but it's also a question this anti-hegemonic European project. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for these uh, comments and uh, what's going on in the 255 committee that is certainly worthwhile uh, worthwhile um, uh, studying and indeed it is very interesting to see that uh, um, uh, Bela Pokol, for example, uh, a quite an eminent Hungarian uh, theoretician of law, but also a judge at the Constitutional Court, he makes very much the point um, that in the European courts there is a hegemonic uh, play um, going on and that brings him to very much criticize that institution and that is something that uh, one has to be uh, very careful and it's very problematic. Uh, Daniel, would you react to these comments? Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for everyone to everyone for taking the time to uh, uh, read that and and comment. So thank thanks very much. Uh, they were great great comments. Um, so uh, just as a basic matter, um, my view: we're always in the grips of power, uh, and we're always in the grips of ideology. Uh, that's just the way the world works. Uh, we can never fully get out of them. So we have an aspirational project uh, to fight uh, domination through power and to fight domination through unreflected ideologies or ideologies that we ultimately uh, that ultimately don't reflect uh, uh, values that we could actually agree to if we were just to understand what they are. So to bring the, ide the, uh, the ideologies to the surface and recognize what they are and reject those that actually don't, 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 don't fit fundamental values. Um, uh, now, the, the, the question is um, what we do between sort of starting maybe with, with Antoine, although I'm sort of going to mix up all these, um, all, I'm going to sort of bring together all these different comments, sort of it's a balancing act um, between the ideals and the Europeanness. Well, uh, yes, it is. Uh, but sort of to bring in Marta, it's a restless tension. It's a restless tension. It's not a compromise. That's sort of what I reject, uh, that, it, that it's a compromise between our aspirations, but then there's the real world. So let's compromise in the middle. No. We always charge towards our aspirations, even if we never actually get there. Uh, that at least is, is my view of, of, how, of how we need to handle uh, this, uh, this situation. Now, um, how can we do this? We have to bring, uh, bring what we are doing to the surface through arguments, through arguments and sort of explaining what we are doing. That's perhaps the most powerful uh, tool that we have at our disposal. To make, our to make our decisions explicit um, as opposed to implicit. Because once we make them explicit, we have to take responsibility for them. We have to be able to explain them to other people. Um, and we have to be able to sort of uh, suffer the pushback uh, that, we might, that we might get from that. So making things explicit is sort of the, the, the best that we can do. And we have often had situations, just think of the United States, the civil rights movement in the 60s, uh, which was incomplete. Um, and uh, just the, the LGBT uh, movement uh, just recently. These were all movements that happened against power, against entrenched power within a system that you might say, um, um, uh, so some people would say happens within a constitutional system that itself is the product of hegemony. Yes, of course, every project will bring in previous power structures, but it doesn't mean that you can't use it uh, for the for the best ideals of the project as you can as you can as you, as you can present it. And that's what the civil rights movement did. That's what the LGBT movement did in the United States. So you can actually work towards progress. Um, in these uh, in, in these systems, uh, so uh, this uh, so in that sense, uh, this is not just about the PSPP decision, and that's why my piece is not just about the PSPP decision. It's much larger about Germany in Europe and the end project of anti hegemony. And I actually think I sort of agree with Marta. Like I don't think the PSPP decision is that bad. Uh, what I think is terrible about it is the timing of it. The timing is just terrible, given what's going on in Poland, what's going on in Hungary. Um, so so that's in th that I think was the, was was the real problem. Now I do think that the German constitutional court actually, if they sort of need to take one piece of advice, Marmin said at one point, so what does this mean for the second Senate, um, would be, I would say, back off on the Kontrolldichte, uh, meaning that's what really went wrong in PSPP. They ratcheted up the Kontrolldichte 
on proportionality, which no common law court that I know of does in that intensity. This is the German way of, of, of ruling Germany, uh, the German constitutional court's way of ruling Germany, which has led to uh, books like Das Entsetzte Gericht, das, uh, Entgrenzte Gericht uh, of, of, of about seven years ago, which was a fascinating uh, book that sort of called out the German court for just basically ruling everything for everyone always. Uh, so they, should, they, they, need, they need to back off. And even if they don't know that they, that they might need to back off within Germany, they need to understand the European Court of Justice is not the German constitutional court for Europe. They do not have that power within Europe, uh, either horizontally or vertically. So what the, 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 the root of the methodological problem, this is sort of where I, where I might take issue with what Anna said, that the German Constitutional Court should not be checking methodologische uh, Grundsätze of the European Court of Justice with the intensity with which it does that, because that's just not how the, uh, ec the, uh, the ECJ works. It works much more like the US Supreme Court, which sort of has much more uh, deference. Sometimes it does combat uh, with, with the political branches, but then it defers to the political branches and it's given up substantive due process long ago. Uh, the German Constitutional Court has not. It does Hartz Fia decision. It does substantive due process all the way down uh, until the present time. So in that sense, the German Constitutional Court, what it needs to understand is that the, that the ECJ is not the German Constitutional Court for Europe. It has a much more delicate federal position at the apex, where it is in a much more tentative relation uh, with the political branches uh, and, and with lots of legal cultures. Um, so that's why, in that some ways, I actually would resist uh, what, what Anna is saying in terms of uh, we should have Germany sort of lead and promote these values and stand for methodological purity um, and for enforcing all of these things. I mean, what you're describing is essentially what American IR theorists describe as American liberal hegemony. Um, that's what American liberal hegemony is, ruling the world according to our standards. Um, and yes, that, that does some good in the world. I agree, it does some good in the world, but ultimately within the European Union, which in my view is a liberal progressive constitutional project, of course, these are my biases, uh, right? Um, is, is a liberal progressive constitutional project, uh, that kind of hegemony is not really called for. It's not appropriate because to my mind, it's not sustainable in the long run. Uh, people will jump ship if it's really Germany ruling the world. Now, what could happen is the European Union should step in. The European Union should step in against Poland uh, more forcefully and against Hungary more forcefully. As the EU, everybody should get together, but this should not be with Germany at the helm. So it's actually quite problematic right now that you have von der Leyen in the commission. And if, if now the commission comes after Poland and now the commission comes after Hungary, it sure looks like Anna's German liberal hegemony. I would much rather sort of have had this happen under, uh, under a Barroso commission or a different commission uh, where you have the European Union uh, get stronger. Um, so in that sense, to my mind, that would be sort of a way to sort of uh, make, uh, make progress uh, in this regard by strengthening, by strengthening the union's process. And just a footnote on 255, I don't, that 255 is a perfect example of existing hegemony. That's why I call my piece anti-hegemony and its discontents. The whole point is there will always be pockets of, of, of hegemonial forces, of power, um, of, um, of culture uh, that are trying to sort of rule the day without, without explaining themselves. And Article 255 was sort of this confluence um, uh, of, uh, of, of an understandable uh, idea uh, that we want to sort of preserve quality. At the same time, it was essentially a screw you move uh, to, to the new Eastern, Eastern countries that we're, we're going to check you in the way we sort of never check anybody else. And we're going to put all of our people on this board uh, sort of make sure that, that, that you satisfy our standards. So Article 255, yeah, it, 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 is, uh, it is one of these discontents uh, within the project uh, of anti-hegemony. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. That was very powerful. And uh, since we are already over the time, it's also uh, the end note of this uh, symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sh uh, coming in and sharing your time with us. It was uh, very enriching to me, and I'm sure it has been very enriching to many people. I very much hope that we will continue this conversation, hopefully in person, so that we would have the time to have a nice dinner or something like that. Uh, afterwards, it will come back. Thank you so much. Have a good evening and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Thank you. Bye-bye.